The Call of the Friend is the last in the series of preliminary videos in the Skillful Living series. Why do I say preliminary? Because if you have followed the series from the beginning, you know that our purpose here is to create an ontology. It's to create a certain name and form to be used in the process of becoming. Our first series, the Foundation Series, introduced dependent origination, the process of becoming or transforming our being in whatever way we desire. The next one, Becoming Genius, taught us how to learn, how to teach ourselves anything that we want to learn at a professional level of expertise. Then, being in the world gave an extended ontological analysis of the average person's condition in this world. And finally, Call of the Friend shows us how to achieve authenticity in an inauthentic world. Now, what's so interesting about all this, for me, is that most of this material, more than 90% of this material, did not come from the Buddha's teaching. It came from the writings of Martin Heidegger. Martin Heidegger was a Catholic. He taught in a Catholic university in Germany in the 1930s. Nevertheless, his teachings form a perfect approach to the teaching of the Buddha. And why is that? Because especially being in the world describes exactly why we need to change our being. It perfectly describes the Buddha's concept of dukkha. Dukkha, well, there are three kinds of dukkha. Ordinary dukkha is, you know, you stub your toe and you feel some physical pain. That's ordinary dukkha. But then there's mental suffering. And this is the real meaning of dukkha, because mental suffering is entirely self-created. And it forms the bulk of our distress in being in the world. Therefore, mental suffering is something that we can actually do something about. The third kind of suffering is when we lose something that we are attached to. But this is going to happen. No way around it because the whole world is impermanent. But out of the three kinds of suffering, the one that we can do something about is mental suffering. And this series gives the background to how we can do that. So let me briefly summarize the material we've presented so far in the Skillful Living series. First, we showed that the process of becoming is a natural law. We are all engaged in a process of becoming at all times. That process has specific stages. And among those stages, in the very earliest part of the process, is name and form. A name and form is roughly equivalent to what we call in Western language an ontology. Uh, in Pali, it's Namarupa. But there was no such word as ontology in those days, so the Buddha used a descriptive term. But he gave it a technical meaning, a special meaning that is exactly equivalent to our understanding of an ontology. A set of terms with specific networked definitions that describe a technical field or an area of application. Sometimes this is called a terministic screen. So the terministic screen is interesting because it determines the limits of our consciousness. If we encounter something, a phenomenon, that is not described in our terministic screen, that is not included in our ontology, chances are we won't recognize it. If we're very astute, we might recognize that it's an unknown phenomenon. But that's about all. 
The creation of an ontology specifically about being and becoming gives us the ability to recognize phenomena connected with being and more importantly gives us the leverage to influence that process in any way that we desire. How do we do that? By changing our ontology, by changing the linguistic structures and assumptions that go into our internal language. And because of the law of dependent origination, it's a natural law like gravity, any change we make in our ontology is going to ripple down through the stages of dependent origination until it becomes our being. So if we want to attain authentic being, if we want to uh, collect our scattered fragments of ourself into an integral whole and recover our integrity, our wholeness, then we must make certain changes in our ontology, in our way of looking at the world, in our mental attitude, in the platform of consciousness. Then the rest of the changes will happen automatically, simply by the influence of time. This is a wonderful thing. So the first step in this process is to recognize our actual situation. Most of us assume that we're being authentic, when in fact we are following a set of choices that is created outside of ourselves. And we are pursuing possibilities that are not uniquely our own. In other words, we're not really an individual. We don't really have integrity. We're not really whole and complete, but we're scattered among an innumerable number of desires, uh, possessions, attachments, and actions that are necessitated by forces outside of ourselves. The first thing we have to do is simply recognize this. And then we have to understand what it is that is holding us back. The simple answer is, even though we're suffering by being in the world, and even though we're called by our own heart to the court of conscience, we suppress this call and we suppress the knowledge of our suffering by thinking, well, I can't do anything about it because it's determined by them. It's determined by the other, by the world. We don't realize our complicity in our bondage in the world. We want to make the other responsible, but as Heidegger points out, the only way any external force could impose a value system upon ourselves is if we ourselves internalize it and give it permission to dominate us. So in other words, we are responsible for our condition. This is the law of karma. Whatever we have done in the past is the cause of our present condition now. And similarly, if we change our activities, if we change our orientation now, our state of being in the future will reflect that. We are giving a set of tools that is non-religious in origin. In fact, it's completely Western in origin. Nevertheless, the striking thing about all of this is that it perfectly prepares us to receive the teaching of the Buddha. The Buddha is the friend. He is the one who has transcended the conditioning of the world. He is the one who is calling us from outside. Okay, you want to make the outside people responsible? Then listen to this guy. He's calling and saying, you are suffering. And there is something you can do about it. It is not determined by forces outside of you, but by your own complicity, your own identification with the world, your own thrownness, 
your own attachment, your own lust and desires. So the Buddha's teaching is a scientific fact. And the proof of this is that it is accessible through Western ontology. In other words, it doesn't depend on faith. It doesn't depend on any accident of birth, being born in a Buddhist family or something like that. If we simply observe using the phenomenological method, our condition of being in the world, we come to the same conclusions as the Buddha. So this to me is a tremendous confirmation of this truth. And I would like to invite all of you to continue on this journey. Now, first of all, if you haven't watched the earlier episodes, if you haven't watched the earlier series, you're going to be lost. <laughs> you're not going to get it. This, is, this whole work is of a piece, even though there are many parts. Please do yourself a favor, if you haven't done it already, and go back and review the earlier series, the foundation series, the uh, learning how to learn, becoming genius, being in the world, and the earlier videos of this series. Because otherwise, you, you won't have the background, you won't have the context. And we're not going to stop here. We're going to go on. This is the last time you'll see me wearing white, because tomorrow I'm going to be ordained as a Buddhist monk. I mean, if you're going to do something, do it all the way, right? But really, it's quite logical continuation of my work, even though it started from an analysis of leadership, which then led to a deep study of ontology. It is winding up in the lap of the Buddha, <laughs> because the Buddha is the one who most perfectly plays the role of the friend. He's not attached to you at all. He doesn't want anything from you. He wants to give something to you, something very valuable and something that is actually already there within you. But he's giving you the method to discover it. Most people have become so alienated from themselves by being in the world that they do not hear the silent summons of the court of conscience within their hearts. Thus, they are convicted by default and live the rest of their lives in dread of death. Karma does not require any external agency, an omniscient divine judge or mystical accounting system. We ourselves are the plaintiff, the judge, and the bailiff. Knowing well what we have done and not done, we condemn and sentence ourselves to a just punishment. In other words, the first uncomfortable truth that we must face is that we are inauthentic. We're not really ourselves. And then the next one is that the possibility that is most our own, that is most original and unique to ourselves is our death. Death has been made into a big scary thing in the West. But it's not so scary considering that we enter the realm of death every night during dreamless sleep. All the Eastern wisdom uh, traditions point this out. So death is not so scary, especially when we approach it on the path of meditation. And this is the path that the Buddha reveals. The vast majority of human beings go after death to lower embodiments, animal wombs or other hellish conditions. These are already conditioned by their activities in this life. The process of dependent origination reliably brings that name and form into manifestation in the next life. This can happen over an entire lifespan or in a moment. This dukkha, suffering or displeasure. The Buddha taught dukkha as the first noble truth because realizing how deeply we are caught in the web of suffering is precisely the motivation to getting out. If we don't realize we're suffering, if we try to adjust to it and say, well, that's just the way it is. Everybody's in the same boat. I'm just going to go along with the crowd. Then we're not really doing our duty towards ourselves. We're cheating ourselves. 
We're not really taking responsibility for our state of being. The fact is we can do something about our suffering. And the main thing that we can do about it is to change our activities and our way of looking at life, our point of view, our mindset, our ontology. We're giving a method of changing your ontology to one that is harmonious with the teaching of the Buddha without any religious trappings, uh, without any need for ceremonies and, and so on and so forth. Uh, there is, a, by the way, there is a valid function for all these ceremonies, and it is to create good karma for ourselves. Most people are engaged in activities pursuing enjoyment. And of course, since karma is an equal and opposite uh, reaction to our activities, the pursuit of enjoyment inevitably leads to suffering. At the very least, when that enjoyment is finished and no longer available when the karma for that enjoyment is run out and there's no more, then what do you do? If you become attached to this pleasure, to this uh, material enjoyment, you'll suffer. But that is avoidable suffering. That can be changed by changing our activities. Instead of taking, instead of trying to enjoy, why not give? Why not share enjoyment? And there's a specific process of doing this, which the Buddha also taught. His teaching has two sides, the devotional side and the meditational side. And they're both useful for different reasons. The friend has been where you are. That is why he can have true compassion on your state of life. He truly sees you as you are and knows your pain. He gives you the call and explains how dangerous being in the world really is. He knows he may have to shock you to get you started on the path out of Dukkha. I've been married twice. I have two children. I went through what everybody goes through in this world. At one time, I was quite well known, making a lot of money in the computer business. I had all the toys I wanted, right up to the house in Carmel, California, and the Mercedes in the driveway and the private recording studio in the spare bedroom. I had it all. And guess what? I was miserable. Then I got on the spiritual path. And after many years of serving my guru, I became a guru myself. I had an ashram in India. I had many disciples. I had money coming in and by donations from all over the world. And writing books and doing hundreds of videos. And guess what? I was miserable. I said, something is wrong. So I resigned from being guru and went back to research the roots of suffering. And what I found is what I'm sharing with you today. So don't think that this is coming from some ivory tower. It's not. It's coming from a streetwise New Yorker, somebody who's been around the block who knows all the moves of the game, and it all sucks. <laughs> so after tomorrow, after becoming a monk, I will have to teach by the book from the Buddha's own words, and I'm going to do that. That's the Vinaya principle. But I'm going to do it in a way that references back to this ontology, back to this context. Because this is a context that anyone in Western culture, which is practically everyone in the world today, everybody is following America. I don't know why. They're following a path that leads to misery. Just look at how everyone's suffering in America. It's pathetic. We're much more free in a funky little country like Sri Lanka. So if you don't want to be caught by this suffering, you have to change your viewpoint. You have to change your outlook, change your background, change your context. The rest will happen by itself. The friend is not God, not a guru, or even a teacher in the ordinary sense. He is someone who cares, but not in the ordinary way of being in the world. The original friend is the Buddha, who saw being in the world for what it is, and then found a way out. He called us, 
and shared his discovery with us over 45 years of dedicated and selfless teaching. Then he disappeared. So now it's up to us. I don't want to get anything from you. I don't need anything from you. I don't want you to become a disciple. I don't want you to send donations. I'm okay. <laughs> the suffering is gone. Can you see? So what I want to share with you is the way, the method, the path that I used to attain this wonderful result. This is the meaning of the friend. The friend says to you, hey, you're suffering. You're in trouble. You're scattered. You're fragmented. You're not really yourself. Snap out of it. <laughs> and then gives a very practical step-by-step -step process for snapping out of it and for attaining the reintegration, the wholeness that you're missing. The Buddha is unbound, gone, gone beyond, gone beyond the beyond. He is never coming back. Each one who gets the call of the friend and realizes his teaching for himself has a responsibility to share this call and teaching with others to help them even as he was called and helped. There is no way to repay the friend's compassion except to become a friend to others. So that's what this is all about as far as I'm concerned. I got so much help from the Buddha through his contemporary representatives and friends. And now I'm passing that help on to you in the best way I know how. And it's not perfect. I'm sure there's a lot of problems and flaws with these videos. I know it. I'm not, I'm not the Buddha. <laughs> I'm not a god. I'm not a guru. I'm not even a teacher in the ordinary sense of the word. I'm sharing my experience with you. That's what a friend does. And a friend also listens. And of course, you can make comments on our blog, ergantic.com. You can send us questions and we'll respond. We're not impersonal. We're willing and ready to engage with you. So you please also engage with us, communicate with us. Let us know your thoughts about these programs. The videos of Skillful Living Network are the call of the friend to you, urging you to make the commitment to seek out authentic being for yourself and share it with others. So far, we have presented the call of the friend in the language of Western existentialism. Existentialism has pretty much become the default mindset of most of the world today. In other words, people no longer have faith in something outside of the world. Religion is decreasing rapidly. People are maybe uh, pretending to be religious for material benefits, but in their hearts, they don't really believe anymore. The majority of people are either atheist or agnostic. Maybe they're spiritual, but not religious. Why is this? Because religion is a conceit. Religion is a fabrication. Religion is something that offers consolation, but not real relief from the suffering of life. In other words, it's just like a little child. A little child is trying to run, falls and, and scrapes his knee, and then he goes to the mother, and the mother consoles him. Can the mother stop the pain? No. But she can console him there, there, it's all right, you know. Religion is a consolation. It is the mark of an immature human being, a child, going to the big daddy in the sky for consolation. And that's all right. We're not saying that you shouldn't be religious, but the fact is most people are not because they have seen through the fabrication. So what we're saying is there is a way to achieve the promised benefits of religion. That is the cessation of suffering without the fabrications and artificiality of religion. There is a way to have a full and complete spiritual life 
without selling yourself out to a guru or an organization or yet another scam that's going to just exploit you. Uh, and the way there is follow the Buddha's teaching. And that's what we're going to be presenting beginning in the next series, which is going to be about integrity. Against this background, beginning in our next series, Being Integrity, we will present the teaching of the Buddha in his own words. This is not dogma or doctrine. We personally followed this path of realizing the teaching of the Buddha. Our direct experience is that following the Buddha's instructions with understanding is the path to the cessation of dukkha. So we're not blowing smoke. This is not a sales talk for some organization or group. You're never going to be asked for a donation. You're never going to be asked to join anything. The only thing you ask is that you're honest with us, just as we've been honest with you. We followed this path with understanding and got the result. So I'm laying it out for you. I'm giving you the work that I went through over the last two years that I personally went through to uh, stop my suffering. And it worked. So this is something I want to give to the world. Now I'm about to disappear beyond the, the ochre curtain. <laughs> there are a lot of things that I will be prevented from talking about by the Vinaya rules. Uh, being a monk is a special situation in life. And there's a lot of confidential things revealed to us that cannot be shared with the general public. So this background, this context that I've shared with you in all of these skillful living videos so far, this is the confidential knowledge that comes from experience that can't be found in any book, that, that can't be speculated. It has to be lived. And I know I haven't done a perfect job of presenting it. There's a lot of things I could have done better and I would like to do better, but I don't have the resources. So I've done what I could do in the time that I had available. And I present this as a gift to you, my friend. And please respond by uh, getting in touch with us on our blog. So the next time you see me, I'll be wearing robes, red robes, as a monk. And until then, Namo Buddhaya, Buddha Saranai.